public comments. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Ben Wojan, Vernon County Conservationist. The government decided the Vernon County Land Conservationists would speak in Monroe County, and the Monroe County Conservationists would speak in Vernon County, because that's um, Want to be clear what we're talking about. Uh, anyone know that we've had floods in the past, especially in 2018, when, and in the West Fork of the Kickapoo watershed in Vernon County. Since then, uh, there's been this long-term study to come up with some ideas and a preferred alternative on what to do. I don't want to steal all of Steve's thunder here, but essentially the recommendation is going to be to decommission all of the dams in the West Fork and the Coon Creek, the only exception being the Jersey Valley Dam, and maybe some of you folks are here for that in particular. So that would probably be the biggest variable that the county needs to decide and where public input is most useful. Otherwise, uh, the study has been ongoing, but uh, the cost-benefit analysis will not really allow us to repair the other dams. Uh, a lot of great conversation at the Coon Creek meeting about uh, how it takes a whole community, it takes partner organizations. There's a lot of work to do on the landscape that can reduce the flooding impact, uh, but we might have to give up the dream of these big dams. And uh, I don't know if Bob has any couple of words you want to share. Thanks. Uh, if possible, our uh, media does like us to speak into these little devices, if possible. Otherwise, Steve, we're good to go. <clears throat> so good afternoon, everybody. My name's Steve Becker. I'm the state conservation engineer for the NRCS out of uh, the Madison State Office. Um, my capacity in speaking today is I'm the contracting officer's representative on an architect and engineering contract uh, to evaluate the flood control measures in the West Fork Kickapoo watershed and to provide uh, project management over this uh, watershed study that's been going on since July of 2020. So. The NRCS uh, has been working in cooperation with uh, Monroe, Vernon, and La Crosse counties on the Coon Creek and West Fork Kickapoo watersheds. Uh, and the need for that cooperation arose from the failure of five dams in 2018, three in Coon Creek and two in West Fork Kickapoo. So after those failures, uh, cooler heads prevailed when people were pretty stressed out and the decision was made to not take a knee-jerk reaction to repair them, but rather reevaluate their functions and values in, in 2020 rather than uh, assume that all of the benefits and costs are of equal value when the dams were conceived back in uh, 1961. So... Uh, <clears throat> the a &E contract was with M&E Consultants out of Texas. They had a couple of subcontractors uh, sub helping them out because it's a multidisciplinary study. So they had uh, EA Engineering do the uh, hydrology and hydraulic analysis and some of the geotechnical work. Um, and we had Forest Econ uh, do the... Uh, economic analysis, and then we had a, a couple of side contracts. Um, one was for about 40000 or so we, with Vernon County to have Mark Erickson, the dam tender, and his staff uh, help us videotape and do some measurements of all the principal spillway pipes in the constellation of dams to see how much life was left in those in those pipes and we kind of added that to an overall review of the structural integrity of the dams just to see how much service life would be left in them. Um, we also had a contract with University of Wisconsin 
Madison to do a climate change analysis, basically look at uh, people's general observations that the storms are more intense and frequent over the last 15 years and what implications uh, a stronger hydrologic cycle would have on the functioning of these dams. Thirdly, we had another subcontract with uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee to look at cultural resources. In, in other words, whether we keep the dams or remove the dams, does it have any impact on uh, architecture or engineering that's, uh, that should be uh, protected or mitigated under the National Historic Preservation Act? or whether there was any cultural resources or you know, indigenous materials below the dams uh, that would have some historical significance. So we did have some subcontract work to kind of round out the report and cover our obligations as a federal agency. So uh, yeah, I will say, OK. I believe the report has what, it, in my estimation, it, it, it covers some of the major uh, uh, major components that would lead to the defense of a preferred alternative. The Coon Creek or the West Fork Kickapoo Watershed Plan is, or the study or the report is a, a thousand forty six pages long. In addition to that, there was about a two hundred page cultural and historic resource report. So in total, there's about 1,300 pages, and I wouldn't expect all of you to read through it, but it's available. It's on the, the, the public website, which was part of the box ads that were in the paper. That website is in there, and you can go into that public website. And there's a couple of things that you'll notice in there. Number one, there's a online interactive mapping feature. If you click it, you can zoom into your property and it will show where the floodplain, the 100-year floodplain will be with and without the dams so you can see the direct effect on your property if you're in the valleys. Secondly, there's a public comment portal. Until February 20th, this stays in draft form and the public has an opportunity to review and comment on the report. All comments that are submitted to that portal will be addressed. The, re the comments and the responses will be posted and they will be part of the administrative record. So I will mention that. Um, so my job today is not only to tell you that I, I believe the report speaks for itself, but to try to give you the crib notes, kind of the high elevation cut of what's in this report. There is a preferred alternative, a recommendation that's been made, and the rest of the report defends that recommendation. There was also a lot of alternatives that were uh, considered and evaluated, and we'll discuss what those were also. So when we went into the dams failed in 2018, which established a need for planning, um, we requested federal funds to do the study, um, which is no small task. There was probably about 45 to 50 people that were uh, intimately involved in the preparation of this report from various disciplines, from geologists to geotechnical engineers to hydrologists, biologists, uh, archaeologists, did I cover all the ologists? There's a lot of ologists. So um, we received the funding. We got about $1.8 million to complete the study. There was roughly 900,000 dedicated to Coon Creek and 900,000 dedicated to West Fork. So once again, the purpose for planning was to evaluate the flood prevention measures in the West Fork Kickapoo watershed from Cashton to Liberty. That's about a 100 square mile area. And determine which measures would be eligible for federal actions through the NRCS watershed program. So it, the report doesn't, isn't a mandate for the county supervisors to act. 
It simply points out a recommendation that the federal government is willing to fund through the watershed program. So I don't, there's a pretty wide uh, uh, set of experiences and exposure to these dams and where they're at. We're talking about nine dams, flood control dams in the uh, West Fork Kickapoo watershed that control about 35% of the watershed. They're in some of the tributaries, the main stem of the West Fork Kickapoo. Those nine dams were originally conceived, uh, designed, and evaluated uh, in, a, in a work plan that was created in 1961. And if you go to that website, you can look at the original work plan and compare this the scope and intent in the planning of these dams compared to the evaluation that was completed uh, in the last couple of months. So the dams were built between 1956 and 1971. So uh, seven of the nine dams came out of the 1961 plan, but there was a couple of dams, Klinkner and Mil Milsna, that were done under a pilot program. Uh, planned in 1954 and implemented in 1956. So in total, there was nine. This table, I don't know how well you can see it. Everything that I'm showing today is pulled out of the report, excerpts from the report. I'll also post this synthesis of the report onto the website too. So if you need the, just the uppercut version, um, you'll have it. So this table here just simply shows that each of these structures had names assigned to them. Probably the person who owned the, owned the land under the footprint of the dam. And then there's a site identification number. Um, the drainage areas behind the dams range somewhere between uh, 800 acres and 4,900 acres. So there's some pretty big drainage areas behind there, behind the dams. The dam heights range anywhere from 28 to 40 feet. Uh, most of the, I believe all the dams except for two have a wet pool. They have a, a pond behind them. There's Milsna and Klinkner are dry dams. They have a, a low flow pipe that allows the base flow to pass through the dam. So. And three of the dams were classified as high hazard by the, the DNR, State Dam Safety Program, which means they have the potential for loss of life if they were to breach. So in 2018, uh, we had about 11 inches of rain in a six hour period. Um, I'm telling you what you already know. So. There's nothing like drowning and having somebody describe the water to you. And that's not my intent. So this is uh, West Fork Kickapoo 1. It was a uh, drone footage of the breach while it was occurring. Um, you can see the 53-acre pool or reservoir on the upstream side, and you can see the breach along the, the right side looking downstream. This is a picture of the Milsna Dam failure. These are earthen dams that are vegetated, so they are kind of inconspicuous a little bit in the landscape. Uh, but the dam is kind of on the left side, and you can see the breach on the right side. Um, this photo here shows looking downstream. All five dams had failed in a similar manner. They all breached at the intersection between the dam and the valley wall. And we'll talk a little bit more about why they failed and what our theory is on why they failed. But the preferred alternative in this plan is to decommission all nine dams in the watershed. We had a meeting uh, in 2021, I believe, between uh, the county conservationists, the EPA, the DNR, the Corps of Engineers, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, 
and we got together and said, what does decommissioning look like? And what came out of that conversation was we were going to notch out the dams, cut a notch in them, uh, in order to pass the 100-year event without backing up or encumbering any headwater. We'd contour the excavated spoil along the residual downstream embankments or along the valley walls. We'd remove the spillway pipes, risers, cantilever outlets, and plunge pools. We'd shape and seed all the slopes to a stable angle of repose and vegetate the accumulated sediment pools and allow the sediments to discharge over time with the geomorphic process. Um, <clears throat> The other preferred alternative in the plan was to replace Jersey Valley Dam. And the replacement location would be somewhere between 800 and 1,000 feet downstream of its current location on county property. It would have an equivalent res reservoir size of about 53 acres and about the same maximum depth of around 34 feet. So the decommissioning of the dams or notching them out the conversation originally started, well, let's remove the dams from the valley floor. Simply remove all of uh, the compacted earth fill in the dam and put it somewhere. And it turns out that's a pretty expensive proposition. Removing a dam from the valley floor is a lot like building a dam in the valley floor. So it'd be about $3 million per dam. And when you're looking at nine dams and, of course, 23 in total with Coon Creek, that adds up. And you say, how can it be $3 million to remove a dam while well, you're trying to haul out 60 to 90,000 yards of soil on roads that weren't designed for that level of traffic? So you'd have to reinforce all the haul roads. You'd have to procure properties to put the spoil on. And the dams aren't all made out of topsoil. You know, they have a core, of a clay core, and then they have you know, a shell made up of excavated materials and things that were used to prepare the foundation. So it's not necessarily material you'd want to put on cropland and try to plant corn over the top. So it only could go in certain locations anyway. So the conversation quickly moved to just saying, what does it take to decommission the dams so that they're safe and less likely to, uh, to breach? I'm going to kind of peel the onion from the outside, but it's like I want to just show a slide of what Jersey Valley Dam replacement would look like. Um, it would look very similar to the one that's there now. The only difference is it wouldn't have an, a vegetated auxiliary spillway. When these dams are designed, they're designed for a certain level of flooding. Normally, they're designed for about a 100-year flood. If you, get, uh, if you get storms greater than that, you want the flow to go around one side of the dam. You don't want it overtopping the dam and taking out your investment. So uh, there's an auxiliary spillway off to the side. It's usually a vegetated auxiliary spillway. Well, those have been problematic with these dams for the last... 30 years. I think uh, Mark Erickson's the dam tender. He'll tell you that erosion on the auxiliary spillway has has happened happened more than once. They're, they're they don't meet today's standards. So the auxiliary spillway or the overflows on these dams would be redirected into a concrete chute, and that's the primary feature you see through the dam. There would still be a principal spillway pipe to flood route smaller storms, because that's the goal of the dam, right, is to catch all the flood water and let it out slow. So there still is a principal spillway pipe that throttles flows for, for large events. But if you were to get a 100-year event or more, it would activate a concrete auxiliary spillway, which would perform much better than the earthen spillways. The 11 inches that we got in six hours or so on in August of 2018 was on the order of somewhere between a 400 and a 500 year event. 
So overflows are an important part of dam building business. So <clears throat> there were some other alternatives evaluated um, before the preferred alternative was chosen, and I wanted to share those with you. Like I said, it's all in the report, but you got to mine your way into it. Um, and these alternatives were explored in, through different lenses. The alternatives were explored through the lens of fish and wildlife and the lens of cultural resources and the lens of fisheries. And so, and um, through the lens of economics. So there's the no action alternative, which is always required in these federal reports. We looked at repair, replacement, rehabilitation, repairing the dams and building more dams. We also looked at removing the dams and trying to see whether that, the function of the dam could be replaced with better upland treatment in the upper watershed. We also looked at replacing a large dam with a multitude of smaller farm ponds in the upper watershed. So we did kind of explore some different alternatives. I tried to kind of like put a one sentence response to each of those, to save a lot of time, but the no action alternative and the repair were dismissed because they don't address the failure modes that cause the other dams to fail. If a dam breaches and you patch it, that doesn't mean you fix the problem, right? And so repair doesn't address the failure mode that caused the original failure. And the no action alternative, just doing nothing, ignores the fact that when you have five dams fail out of 23, that's a high probability in the engineering world. If I told you that five out of 23 planes crash, would you get on one? Right? So it's very bad statistics. And the dams that did fail are under DNR administrative order to, to stabilize those sites and decommission them. So uh, we looked at replacement and quite in a nutshell, the benefits of replacing the dams don't exceed the replacement cost, which is estimated at around 61 million. We looked at rehabilitation. And rehabilitation is kind of a fancy word for reworking the, going back in and reworking the dam, trying to add features to it that should have been in the original design, fortify shortcomings, um, install new materials to give it another 50 years of life, because all these structures are 50 or 60 years old now, so they're not quite what they were. They were built, of course. So we look carefully at rehabilitation because most people have the mindset of trying to fix something before they throw it away. So we looked at rehabilitation, and what we found out is by the time we were done trying to meet current state and federal standards, there wouldn't be much of the original dam left. So that was dismissed. The additional dams dismissed for the reasons that the nine dams don't the benefits don't exceed the cost, so additional dams wouldn't pass that bar. Uh, we looked at land management changes, which in this watershed, we found them to be fairly effective uh, up to storms of a 25-year, 24-hour duration. Um, but the land management is all on private property, and owners are going to do what owners do, and so we needed to move that level of land treatment, which is highly regarded and it's something I spent a career on and so is the county conservationist here, it has merit. Um, but we need to do that under programs that are set up for voluntary conservation. Um, and so it was deferred, same way with the multitude of smaller farm ponds. In the big scheme of upper land treatment, contour strips, terraces, reduced tillage, farm ponds, grass waterways, prairie strips, riparian buffers, they all kind of fall under the same category. 
So the cost of decommissioning these dams, not necessarily cheap either. Uh, the construction cost for decommissioning the nine dams is about $6.8 million. Um, if you add the engineering fees, permitting, administrative fees, all that, that's, it's close to $8 million to decommission those nine dams. Um, our, a our agency felt that, and we'll talk about it more in detail, but the geotechnical vulnerability of these dams and the, the propensity they have to fail means that we kind of want to decommission these in a short time frame. The state has a dam removal grant program. Uh, <laughs> the state has a dam, a state dam removal grant program, but it's not funded very, very well. It's, I think on a normal year, they have like 60 or 80,000 available. We are look, uh, Vernon County is looking at decommissioning Millsna, but they had some extra, it was a good bonding year or something, but they had some extra money to, to jump out ahead on Millsna. But anyways, we, due to the, the lack of resources at the state level, we requested a, a variance to pay 100% of the construction cost for decommissioning. So the federal share would be about 7.7 .7 million. There still is a residual county share, but it has to do with uh, administrative fees and permitting that we can't cover. The cost of replacing Jersey Valley Dam is around $16 million. And with engineering fees and permitting, et cetera, it came to about 18 million. Uh, We've kind of went back, had some discussions with our headquarters in Washington, and we've decided to honor the original uh, cost share split used in dam con in constructing the dam in 1971. And under that arrangement, the government paid 100% of the cost of dam construction for flood control, and they cost shared 50-50 on components related to recreation or wildlife. So how that relates to this dam is we'll pay 100% of the dam for its flood control function, but to raise in an extra 15 feet to create the recreational pool that people enjoy on that county park, um, that's a split, and that's why the county share is around a half million for that lift on the dam to provide the recreational pool. So just to peel the onion a little deeper, what caused the two, the two dam failures and the three in Coon Valley, they're all related. We had some geologists uh, evaluate all the dams and in consultation with geotechnical engineers there there is a, a distinction uh, we had some of these dams have had some major repairs and so we had some uh, soil borings and soil testing we also have some geotech geotechnical tools that basically x-ray the foundation and give us an idea of what's under the dam um, we kind of pulled all of it together, and the explanation is that there are geologic stress fractures or cracks in the existing sandstone foundation along the abutment walls and along the valley bottom. And those cracks in that sandstone create preferential seepage paths around the ends of the dam and under the dam. And when under full pool conditions, which is what we had in 2018, when the pool is high enough for long enough, the water quickly finds those cracks and moves and starts flowing water through those cracks and it starts sucking out the fine grain embankment soil used to build the dam. And since those cracks are in sandstone, the cracks themselves, material is getting stolen out of the cracks themselves. 
And in some of the cracks, they were filled with weathered sand. All of that was washed out. And as the flow moves through those cracks and starts taking uh, soil from the dam along that interface between the dam and the valley wall, it starts to undermine the dam. We call that internal erosion, and eventually a hole develops in the dam, and you get a blowout of rock and soil overburden over the top. I guess you don't have to be much of a geologist to go out to Jersey Valley Dam and walk through the breach and see the cracks in the sandstone. So maybe we paid a lot of money to take a picture of what everybody knew happened. Um, but uh, the cracks are pretty evident. The problem we had, I think, back in 1961, that was the infancy of dam building in this country. The NRCS built 12,000 dams in the United States between 1960 and about 1975. And so they, we've learned quite a bit about dam building, but back in 1961, we didn't have a lot of the techniques and technology to address these fractured uh, sandstone foundations or how to treat foundations in general. I. Uh, this is a picture of, if, if you Google it, I, work, I was a state engineer in Montana for 13 years, and I had a chance to get down to Idaho and see the, the Teton Dam failure, which was built for the purpose of irrigation. It was an irrigation reservoir. I had to go look at it because we studied it in college. You know, if you're an engineer, they tend to focus a little time on failures. But it was very, it's a very similar it's a very similar failure um, that greatly heightened our agency's awareness and understanding of internal erosion as a failure mode. And you can see in the photos on the internet the cracked uh, bedrock foundation on the right. And you, in the upper left, I know the screen isn't, it's not showing good contrast, but movement of flow through those cracks on that left, on that uh, interface between the dam and the valley wall created a big hole in the dam that eventually caved in and became a weir and a breach. And when you stand there, the dam looks like the day it failed. It's a monument to failure, so to speak, but it looks the same, just a magnitude and size bigger than what happened in... Um, the West Fork Kickapoo watershed. And I only mention it because that failure occurred in 1976. And that's kind of when the Bureau of Reclamation, the Corps of Engineers, the NRCS, all the federal agencies learned a great deal about a dam failure through you know, just forensic evaluation. All of that learning was predated by the construction of the dams in the West Fork Kickapoo watershed. So the main points from the geotechnical investigation is that internal erosion may be going on for years without any visible signs of distress. And the dams can fail suddenly by internal erosion after years of seemingly trouble-free performance. Um, the failure mode may be in progress, but it may not have advanced to the point of where it's visible. And the dams may not have experienced the duration of a full reservoir for sufficient time to allow that failure mode to progress to the point of failure. So it's our opinion that the remaining seven dams in the watershed share the same geotechnical vulnerability and they could fail. And that led or drove us to the preferred alternative in this plan. And so some of these other slides that I'm going to show you kind of start to examine the effects of a breach dam and looking at the valley condition with and without the dams. So what's missing in the West Fork Kickapoo dams? Well, a defense against internal erosion, of course. So what does that mean? Well, there's no deep cutoff into the bedrock along the valley wall 
or into the valley floor. So the dams are basically, they stripped the foundation of loose material and started building the dam, but there's no keyway or core trench into the valley walls or into the valley floor of any significance. There's a lot of new technology that's come along. The oldest technology is you simply blast or rip the rock out and create a keyway and pack it full of clay. But in the case of this fractured sandstone, we need to go into the foundation and the abutments by at least 50 feet. And so that can be pretty challenging. And so they're in the business of dam building today, they have things like bentonite slurry trenches and concrete secant walls, some technologies that allow for a deep cutoff curtain. Um, also, it doesn't have after the dam is, the foundation is opened up to build a dam and you cut a keyway 30 to 50 feet into the foundation and into the valley walls, the next step is to what we call dental grouting. Is we sand or, uh, use uh, pressure washers and we clean the face of the rocks off and we grout all those cracks. And after all the cracks are grouted and it's painstaking, it's like, um, looking at patching asphalt cracks in a in a parking lot, you know, where you got to chase them all down. You've seen those guys chase all those down with the tar. It's the same thing with, with the grout, trying to get everything grouted. But once it's grouted, then we come over the top with a sand and gravel drain as a redundant measure of defense. So anything that gets through those foundations are absorbed by a sand and gravel drain and is taken safely out the back of the dam. So the Jersey Valley dams are missing a deep cutoff, they're missing rock treatments, they're missing internal abutment drains. The other thing that the dams are missing is what we call uh, internal embankment drains. But when they build an earth dam today, right across the center line of the dam, from one valley wall to the other, they build a sand curtain through the middle of the dam from the top to the bottom. And the objective of that is when they build a dam, there's certain foundations aren't level. There's differences in elevation of, of where you start building the dam. So these dams settle differentially, and that could create a crack in the dam. If there's a crack in the dam, water can flow through it and create internal erosion. So that sand feature, that sand curtain, intercepts that water and takes it safely out the back slope but soil can't penetrate that sand gradation and it sort of is a self-healing effect to compensate for cracks. So anyways, those are the deficiencies in the dam and those are what cost money. And that's why if all of those were implemented, rehabilitation wouldn't leave much of the original dam left. Then there's also this issue of the auxiliary spillway stability and integrity. Those are two separate issues, and we talked about it before. So the picture on the top right shows when the overflow spillway was activated, it starts stripping off all the sod and topsoil. And you can see a blow up of it in the lower right. So we've improved our modeling and our designs for overflow spillways or auxiliary spillways. These dams don't have it. They're very narrow spillways. They're butted up against the hillside. They're shaded. They experience a lot of seepage from the abutments. And so the soils are softened up or oftentimes in a saturated condition before the storm flows even start moving through it. And so the remedies are to increase the width or put more resilient soil in them. That's one issue. The other element of this auxiliary spillway design, they call it integrity. And basically it's, if you get a big enough storm and the overflow starts to flow, how much bulk and resilience does it have to head cutting and discharging the entire pool suddenly? So we call that auxiliary spillway integrity, and we have uh, some pretty complicated models that 
show how a head cut would advance through an auxiliary spillway for a given hydrograph. And if it finds out the breach makes it through the dam in the model, then we increase the width of the, the spillway. Or you can increase, put in concrete cutoff walls, or you can go with the concrete chute spillway, which is what we're proposing for a Jersey Valley rebuild. Economics played a, played a pretty big role. I'm probably being a little obtuse, but I think back in 61, when the federal program came out to start building dams, I think the engineers and the conservationists started laying them out in the landscape, and when they were done, they slid them over to the economists and said, justify it. Now it's just the opposite. I think the economists take a lead on these projects, and the engineers support it in a lot of ways. So, <coughs> Anyways, the original economic analysis for those nine dams in 1961 showed a benefit to cost ratio of 1.2 to 1. In other words, they estimated that there'd be a dollar twenty in benefits for every dollar spent on dam construction and maintenance, and that was a requirement for, and still is a requirement for federal funding with taxpayer dollars. If it's a federally funded project, the benefits have to exceed the cost, so you have to have or demonstrate a benefit cost ratio of at least one to one. We had uh, an opportunity here, I'd say almost, uh, I would say almost a need to look back over the last 60 years and say, was building those dams worth it? Was building the dams worth it? So we were able to get all of the precipitation records for the last 50 or 60 years in the watershed. And every rainfall event, we dropped it into a bucket into a storm bucket. How many two-year floods or storm events did we get? How many 25-year events? How many 100-year events? And we put them in buckets. And each one of those storm events is associated with a certain amount of damages. So we multiplied the damages by the number of times those storms occurred over the last 50 or 60 years, and we recreated the benefit-cost ratio. And quite honestly, it wasn't, it, it was a break even proposition in the Coon Creek watershed. It was a little bit dismal in the West Fork Kickapoo. It was only 0.3 to 1. In other words, 30 cents in benefits for every dollar spent in construction and maintenance. Then we added recreation to it, the value of Jersey Valley Dam as a rec, as a a keystone as a unique water feature in the driftless area. There isn't too many lakes in the driftless area, right? So it draws a certain amount of people, and a lot of you here have uh, fished there or spent time there with your families. There was a lot of recreational benefits obtained, and the economists amazed me by their access to things like fishing fishing days and opportunities and the value of trout fishing in the region and the ability to put dollar values on that and how much is spent per rod per day. And if a bridge washes out and the traffic is redirected, they take traffic counts on Highway 14 and there's an algorithm to distribute those traffic loads to all the subsidiary roads. All of that was kind of figured in. So I do believe it was a comprehensive analysis, but if you had recreation into it, the benefit-cost ratio jumps to 1.6 to 1, which is impressive, and it led us to the preferred alternative to replace Jersey Valley Dam. So we figured there was about $9.3 million in benefits over the last 50 or 60 years um, for those nine dams, but if you add Jersey Valley's recreational values, that's $46 million. And there was roughly 33 million in construction and maintenance. So you'd say, how did that go so wrong? How can Coon Valley be estimated at $1.20 in benefits for every dollar spent? And when you did the retrospective analysis, you found out it was pretty well a wash. But you come over to West Fork Kickapoo, 
the original designers found a benefit cost ratio of 1.2 to 1, and now we look back on it, it's only 0.3 to 1 for flood control. And the primary reason was because there was some pretty uh, expensive maintenance items in this watershed. When they Klinkner Dam, which is a high hazard dam, uh, needed to be upgraded because of its potential for loss of life. There was no room to increase the size of the spillways, and so they allowed it to be overtopped, and they, they put a blanket of articulated concrete mats over the entire back slope to allow that dam to overtop. That was $3.6 million in 2005. Jersey Valley Dam had excessive seepage coming out of the abutments that worried a lot of people. And so the plan was is to drill a hole about every 10 feet across the entire dam and pump grout into those holes, send the grout into the cracks and things that might be driving seepage through the dam. So they did an entire row all the way across the dam about every 10 feet, 15 feet apart, 30 feet deep and they pumped grout in it. And when they were done, they went back. They went up five feet or 10 feet and did it again. And then they went up 10 feet or so and did it again. So they had three rows of holes across the entire dam, about 10 foot spacing, all pumped with grout. And it still failed. So that was $4.4 million in 2009. So you add that to the cost and maintenance of the dam, it drove the benefit cost ratio down by a lot. So here's a table, it's table two, it's in the report. It shows the cost in 2020 dollars, all of the costs were brought to present day value. The study started in July of 2020. Um, it shows what the costs were for each of the Coon Creek dams and the costs for the West Fork Kickapoo, that includes the cost to construct it, the engineering fees, the inspection fees, the maintenance over time, and the major repairs. All that's kind of lumped together. And you can see Klinkner and uh, West Fork Kickapoo stand out. So I thought, I just thought I'd pop this chart out. This is just I talked about looking back at the precip record for 50 or 60 years and taking all those precipitation or those rainfall events and dropping them into buckets. So there was 44 storms that were equivalent to a two-year, 24-hour storm. There was 25 five-year storms, five 10-year storms, two 25-year storms, one 100-year storm, and one 500-year storm. That's 2018. So like I said, each one of those storm events is a certain is associated with modeled floodplain damages. And that's, it's the aggregation of those storms times the damages that give you the, that give you the benefits of the dam, right? Those are damages prevented. <clears throat> So we did a projected economic analysis looking at replacing all of the dams for another service life of 50 years. And we found that there was about 16 cents of benefits for every dollar spent. 16 cents in benefits for every dollar spent. So to kind of put that in perspective a little bit, the original dams were built for around $138,000 a piece in 1960. In 2020 dollars, that's about $900,000. So eight of those nine dams, and I'll say eight, eight of those nine dams were built for around $900,000 a piece in today's dollars. But if we have to replace them or re to today's standards, it's roughly 4.2 million each, except Jersey Valley. Jersey Valley was constructed for $593,000 in 1971. In today's dollars, that's 3.4 million. 
to replace that dam, it's 17.6 million today. So it takes an awful lot of benefits. If you were to take, if we were to replace Jersey Valley Dam, and it costs $17.6 million, what the economist does is he says, let's put $17.6 million into a savings account at 2.5% interest for 50 years. That's the amount of benefits that you need to justify building the dam. And that's a big number. So that's kind of, that's sort of the mentality. And if I misspoke, we have our economists here. Did I misspeak? Does that sound right? Okay. Um, decommissioning the, the, the dams are also a low benefit cost ratio, right? 0.06 to 1. Six cents of benefits for every dollar spent to decommission. However, the economists struggled a little bit with the benefit cost ratio for dam decommissioning because we couldn't put the cost, the benefits of avoiding a dam breach in there. So the problem with doing an economic analysis on a dam breach is you don't know what the magnitude of the breach is and you, more importantly, you don't know when it will occur. And if you don't know when, when it will occur, you can't put it in the economic timeline to compute a benefit cost ratio. So lastly, we looked at decommissioning the nine dams, and that includes that includes removing Jersey Valley Dam, right? Because the county supervisors have decisions to make: remove some of the dams, remove all the dams. Um, remove none of the dams, and Jersey Valley replacement might take a while. So the cost to decommission all nine dams and replace Jersey Valley, if you kind of put it all together, we got about $1.86 in benefits for every dollar of cost, which is an outstanding benefit cost ratio, but it's largely driven by the recreational benefits of Jersey Valley Dam. So if we remove, the, if we remove eight dams, um, what are the impacts of those eight dams? That's the preferred alternative. Remove eight dams, re, rebuild Jersey Valley. Um, what's the impacts of that? Well, on, because the valleys are so narrow and because the dams only control 35% of the watershed, the change in the 100-year floodplain is only 239 acres. And that's, that's a sliver of change over about 35 miles of West Kickapoo main stem and the tributaries. So um, there, it probably has more to do with depth than it does uh, acreage. So it's not a very substantial amount of acreage with and without the dams. I think that's pretty important because over time, when people see all this excessive flooding, and they hear about flood control and dams, they kind of associate it, it, it. The effect and the impact of the dams sort of take, a life, take on a life of its own. They, they tend to be inflated. The benefits of the dam can be inflated, and I think that's what happened here, is they probably don't have the amount of benefit that a lot of people would hope or think it, it does. Um, but nevertheless, there are impacts. So if we remove those eight dams, there are going to be some houses that never seen water that could see water on a 100-year event. If you go to that public website, like I said, there's an online uh, mapping viewer in there, and you can just track the entire watershed from Cashton all the way down to Liberty. And you can look at specific properties, and it'll show you where the floodplain is today and where the floodplain would be when the dams are removed. And you can kind of make that assessment for yourself. I, I can't build enough maps with enough resolution to flop up here to show you what the changes are everywhere. And that's the value of GIS these days is you can load that into kind of an interactive experience to see where the problems are. But these houses here, for example, are going to see a little more flooding. 
I don't know much about these properties. I don't know if they were there before the dams were even built or not. But I do know that the zoning in Coon Creek and the zoning in West Fort Kickapoo has been highly effective over the years. There hasn't been a lot of building in the floodplains. So it's likely some of these houses were in the flood zone before the dams were built. Uh, there are four, uh, sorry, 14 public and private crossings that would be flooded by smaller storms. In other words, 14 public and private crossings are going to have, are going to lose some protection benefits. They're not going to just wash out, but it's, they're going to overtop with a smaller storm. So the most impacted crossing is Deaver Lane and Highway 56 at Liberty and County Road Y and Smith Road. At those sites, they're losing protection from, uh, like at Highway 56 and Liberty, it, it, had, it was enjoying a 100-year a level of protection. In other words, if you got a 100-year storm, it wouldn't overtop, and now it would be a 50-year level of protection. Those are issues that, that's why we've, brought the county highway department folks and uh, DOT in on the planning study and let them know um, replacing bridges and updating roads is not something we can do under the watershed program. There's fund integrity issues. DOT is funded for roads. We're funded for not doing roads. And so we're, we're not going to overlap each other's space that those crossings probably would have to be updated at some point. Uh, there was some talk about the floodplain management issues with the preferred alternative. So West Fork Kickapoo uh, Valley is part of the flood insurance program, or at least portions of the valley are. So when FEMA did that flood insurance mapping, and establish the base flood elevation that creates eligibility and non-eligibility uh, for loans, for houses, et cetera. You know, I mean, there's a lot of implications with being in a flood zone and not being in the flood zone. We, I talked with uh, the floodplain managers at DNR, and they said that the dams were not considered in the establishment of that flood insurance uh, study or in that base flood elevation. So there is going to be no changes to the there is going to be no changes to the base flood elevations or the floodplain mapping for the flood insurance program. There is some mapping issues in and around the dams themselves. They call it Zone A. It, it wasn't modeled for the flood insurance program. It was more or less artistically drawn to kind of identify where the 100 year would be in that area. And so you'll see there's some mapping around the reservoir areas of the dams. And the DNR would expect us to correct those maps, but it would, it's not going to have any implications on Zone AE, which is what's setting the insurance rates and eligibility. Um, so there is cost with doing that remapping, and we figured it's about twenty-five thousand dollars per dam and a hundred thousand to remap Jersey Valley, remap Zone A. Right. Uh, we took a look at cultural resources. So I, I said there was some subset studies that were done. Um, we hired UW Milwaukee, who, in my opinion, didn't outstanding job in developing about a 150 page document looking at uh, arche archaeology and um, architectural significance uh, in and around uh, in and around the, the floodplain below these dams what we're looking for is is there anything going to are there any architecturally significant or archaeological sites that would be threatened by the removal of the dam? Because we would have some obligation to mitigate that effect if we're going to use federal funding to remove them. 
So they did uh, their literature reviews. They did a field survey. The, the team went out to each dam and they um, did their archaeological investigation within a thousand feet below each dam. And they also walked the entire floodplain um, looking in that differential area, that 200 and some acres, looking for uh, structures that were out of the floodplain and now would be in the floodplain. So the other thing they looked at is these dams are, they're a uh, relic themselves. They were built 50, 60 years ago. So they looked at the constellation of dams as a historic district in and them themselves. And they found that they weren't uh, eligible for the National Historic Register in terms of just being part of history. Um, and there was nothing unique about the engineering or architecture of the dams that would put it on the Federal Register either. There were a couple of properties that were identified in and around the floodplain, uh, the, Blooming, the Bloomingdale School and uh, the Anton Nelson Farmstead. I think he had some uh, log cabin type buildings or something like that. But we took a closer look at the, at the floodplain modeling and found out that both structures were outside of the floodplain with or without the dams. But I only mention it because that's kind of the level of scrutiny we gave to the preferred alternatives. You understand what kind of level of intensity we gave it. Um, they also looked for uh, artifacts or uh, cultural resources of significance. There was nothing found at seven of the nine dams. They did find three sites that were identified at two of the dam sites. And these, they were kind of lithic scatter sites. In other words, they found materials that um, Native Americans would be used for tool making and things like that. Um, but they found that those sites had low integrity um, and they were not eligible for the National Historic Register. So no additional archeological investigations are recommended. Um, fish and wildlife impacts were also looked at. We looked at uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, looked at their threatened, endangered, and candidate species. We, had, we paid the DNR to do a site-specific endangered resource review, which means they take a look at a radius around the dams and compare it to a list of known sites where they've, they've found these endangered plants or animals. So we've taken a close look, and we haven't found any major impacts in terms of fish and wildlife. When we replace Jersey Valley Dam, if and when that decision is made, we will do an, a tiered environmental review specific to the final plans of the dam. But at the moment, we don't know how much borrow material would be used to build the dam and where it would come from. And we, we don't know where the spoil material would go. And so it's really hard to complete. Uh, a certain level of environmental review that has to kind of be done in concert with the final design. Uh, I, don't, I think I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, fish. I wanted to talk about fish for a little bit. There's about 70 miles of class one through three trout waters in the watershed. About 1.6 miles of stream is eliminated under the footprint in the pool of these dams. So by removing the dams, we'd be adding about 1.6 miles of stream. And we would also be connecting um, some stream upstream to the stream below, right? Restoring connectivity. Um, and there's a chart there. It's also in the paper shows the stream length upstream of the dams that would be reconnected to the system for better or worse, right? And so there was some conversations with the DNR that on three of these sites, Jersey Valley, West Fort Kickapoo 5 and 17, um, that there's a native strain of brook trout that they're trying to protect from invasion by brown trout. And the dams provided that 
barriers so that they, the DNR could focus on habitat for brook trout. You remove the dams, now the browns, supposedly, you know, they can race in there and dominate because they're good at that. How's that sound? And I'm not a biologist, that's pretty, very disrespectful of the way I'm talking about it all, but I'm just giving you my cut on it. So um, there was some talk about reestablishing some type of a barrier. For example, a sheet pile wall with a five foot overfall or something where the fish can't get up and over. It's, it's not a bad idea, but if it was constructed under this program, it comes with constraints. So constraint number one is if you build a sheet pile cutoff, for example, something that's pounded to rejection into the foundation, and it can withstand all the floods that would be funneled across it. The benefits have to exceed the costs. So it's tough to put a value on fish, so we would do some type of a trade-off analysis, so that's possible. However, if it's built, it's built under this economic evaluation period of 50 years, which means if we build it, the county is responsible for operation and maintenance for 50 years. And if they fail to maintain it or it's rendered inoperable, they have to pay the money back with interest to the federal treasury. That was the original deal in the construction of these dams. It's the same deal that applies to the future dams and any components thereof. So you can put it in. The other risk is you can put that sheet pile wall in and you can get a big flood and the sediment could wash over the top of it and render it ineffective anyway. So those are all risks that the county supervisors would have, have to make and it would be my recommendation that if they are built, they're built on a, under a program that's less restraining than this one would be because that's a pretty big burden to maintain something for 50 years and ensure its operation, not just allow sediment to blanket over the top and the fish swim over the top, and that's not how it would work. We would catch it on an oversight and review and it'd have to be maintained. So, uh, so these dams, when we, if we remove them, if and when we remove them, there's a sedim accumulated sediment pool. Sediment's been accumulated behind these dams for 50 or 60 years. And the plan is to allow those sediments to kind of flush out through the normal geomorphic process, right? That we wouldn't go in there and do hydraulically dredging and remove the sediments before we breach the dam. There are a lot of dams being removed across the country uh, to restore fist passage, etc. Um, avoid maintenance. There's all kinds of reasons why some of these dams are taken out around the country. The, the one closest to us would be the Baraboo River Dam. I can't remember the year that that was taken out. But that dam was removed and the sediment was allowed to flush downstream. And that seems to be the mode of operation for most dam removal projects that have come to my attention, with the exception of some of the dams when I was in Montana, because they had a lot of heavy metal mining in the watershed and a lot of those tailings and stuff got into the sediment pools behind the dams and so those were super fun sites. So that's not really the case here. We did go out and test four of these dams, two in Coon Creek and two in West Fork. Um, and we took two samples at two of the dams because they're expensive, right? Eventually they'd all be tested but within the scope of a programmatic EIS, we tested a couple. Um, and we tested for everything. We tested for atrazine, because these structures were built back when they were still using that. We tested for pesticides, heavy metals, PFAS, nutrients, the whole palette. So what we found is what you would expect to find, the sediments are hot and phosphorus. There were no pesticides or heavy metals. Um, and I do have a chart on the PFAS, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the average sediment accumulation behind the dams is a little tricky because a lot of them had a wet pool and it was a, a LIDAR comparison to the original uh, stage storage curve for the dam design. Um, and you know, LIDAR bounces off the water surface. But 
to the best of our estimation, there's about 21 acre feet behind each dam. Uh, when the dams breached, they gave the, the engineers an opportunity to look at the formation of a channel through the sediment pool. And based on, yep. He could join us. <laughs> All right. Anyways, they, looking at these five breaches, we came up with kind of an estimate of how the sediment might evacuate from the dam, and these are the estimates of the amount of sediment that would be discharged on an annual basis for three years. So you can make a judgment on that. Um, And like I said, what they did is just looked at the breach dam and the formation of the base flow channel through the sediment pool. And the Coon Creek and a couple of the West Fork Kickapoo dams, you know, there's dogwoods, willows, sod, reed canary, so a lot of, them, of the pools, these are fairly small dams in the big scheme of things, and so the pools do have a certain amount of vegetative stabilization with them, so it's not like you know, the sediment's going to blow out of there in like one year or anything like that. I, most of the sediment is moved on an annual average basis with bank full flows. Big storms do move sediment, but it's nothing compared to the stream working on the channel every day, all day, 24-7. That's what's moving all the flow and the sediment. So anyways, we have an approximation for that, and we don't feel like the contribution of sediment behind the dam downstream um, is anything to be concerned about. I think that was bared out in some of the DNR studies on the Baraboo River removal. Also, we compared uh, sediment discharge rates to Stan Trimble's study. He did a 60-year study, a sedimentation study in Coon Creek, which is the watershed next door. Gave us some idea of what kind of sediment fluxes are moving through these valleys and what's behind the dams is really a very inconsequential amount of sediment compared to all the sediments that move through the valley on an annual basis. So, uh, Here's a stream shot of the channelization kind of behind Millsna Dam. And you can kind of see the failure there on the left side. Here's a shot of the PFAS. The slide's a little out of place, but um, at present there, are, there is no PFAS or PFAS limits for federal action at present. And the dams where we did detect PFAS, they did not exceed any uh, industrial contact limits for soil. As a matter of fact, they're a substantially small fraction of the current guidelines that are out there. So you hear a lot about PFAS. It's kind of like, I almost get the impression it's in a lot of places. Um, so it would, doesn't, shouldn't surprise anybody that there's detection of it in the dams. But on the left side, the units are in nanograms per kilogram. So that's equivalent to parts per trillion. And so the contact guidelines right now are in parts per million. So we're quite a ways, the detection limits are quite a, quite a distance below the current <laughs> guidelines. But the whole PFAS thing is uh, the thresholds and the EPA guidance is uh, rapidly progressing. And, but I don't think there's a problem here and I don't, think the team felt there was a problem and the, so I will mention that you know one of the reasons we go into these plans with cooperating federal and state agencies is to look at some of these issues right so this plan is being done in cooperation with the US Fish and Wildlife Service the EPA and the Corps of Engineers and of course the different departments at DNR 
And so um, we hope through the public comment period that those agencies will also comment in a formal way and can make comments on some of the testing that's been done. Um, just to kind of put that sediment in context, when West Fork Kickapoo failed, there was 56,000 yards of material that came out of that dam. So as you go back through the report independently and you look at what we think the sediment accumulations are behind the dam and what we think the sediment yield will be on an annual basis, you kind of compare it to maybe um, the high potential for breach and what kind of sediment load uh, or slug that creates and the concerns that that creates to habitat downstream. Um, other impacts of a breach. I mean, that's, at the end of the day, that's driving, um, the high potential for a breach is driving our recommendation to remove the dams. So the impacts of a breach need to be fully disclosed. So, you know, three of those dams are classified as high hazard. Of course, two of them have failed. Klinkner is the one that remains with the potential for loss of life if that one fails. Additionally, there's 38 public bridges and crossings in the West Fork Kickapoo watershed, but not all of them are in the floodplain. Um, there are 167 farm service structures or farm service buildings within the floodplain that could be impacted by a breach. And Vernon County, I know they required to have a breach inundation map, a map that shows where the breach wave would go if the dam were instantaneously lifted. And so those maps are publicly available and you can see who's in and who's out. Um, so just kind of wanted to mention that, that there's 167 farm service structures with an estimated value of 4.8 million if a dam were to breach. Um, there is a population at risk issue. It was an estimation based on who could be on the roads at the time of a breach how many potential fishermen could be fishing on that day if it were to breach. Um, we came up with a total population at risk of 101. That would be if all dams failed at once, which is not gonna happen, but you can, it's itemized per dam what we thought the population at risk would be. That's different than loss of life potential. And there are formulas and models that take population at risk and convert that down to a subset of potential loss of life. We didn't do that because the numbers are kind of all over the place. And so we just kind of left it at how many people could be at risk. And it's a little subjective. Um, but uh, I'm getting pretty close to the end here. Thanks for bearing with me. We looked at some alternatives to these large dams. So we looked at land management changes in the upper watershed. So if we remove the dams, what could be done in the upper watershed to increase infiltration and reduce runoff so that the hydrograph would look similar downstream to if the dams were in place. It's very difficult to know, I mean, with 60 some thousand acre watershed, um, and out of that watershed, 23,600 acres are cropped roughly. What types of conservation practices will be adopted? When they'll be adopted? How long the, the landowners will keep them in place? It's all private land and people are gonna kinda do what they're gonna do. So it was really hard to develop a mosaic of potential land use changes in any reliable fashion, and so we didn't. <laughs> we simply worked with the hydrologist to say, what happens? Let's try to bookend the effect. Let's create a bookend. We know what the floodplain maps look like with and without the dam today, based on the land use today. What would happen 
if all the woods stayed woods and we converted all 23,000 acres of cropland to grass, what would happen? So we would have a bookend and that any future programs or initiatives to improve or accelerate land conservation between those two bookends could be interpolated in terms of the effect on the floodplain and the cost. And so there's quite a bit of charts in there. And by land management changes, right, I don't know if everybody knows kind of what we mean, but I think you do, right? It's crop rotations, contour strips, grass waterways, reduced tillage, fencing cattle out of woodlands, all of that um, uh, cover crops, all of that stuff kind of falls under uh, the different varieties and techniques that are appropriate for different land uses and soil types all over the watershed. And like I said, that's a very complex modeling exercise to, to decide who's going to adopt what, when, and where, and for how long. And so we just looked at planting everything to grass and trying to see what would, uh, what would happen. So there's a pretty detailed set of tables in the report that show the change in flow depth, the change in flow um, at different points in the watershed, like at Avalanche, Bloomingdale, Liberty. And so you can look at those charts yourself. It takes a while to digest them, so I don't have like high expectations. You can look at this bar chart and go Eureka or anything, but you know the blue line represents the, the flow rate at Liberty uh, with the dams. The yellow line represents the flow rate at Liberty uh, with all dams removed, except Jersey Valley. And then the green line represents a con removing the eight dams and converting uh, the cropland to grass. And so there is a little bit of difference between here and Coon Creek, but you'll notice that um, the peak flows are lower with good land management practices than the effect of the dams. Land Conversion from cropland to grassland beats the dams for the lower storms in this watershed. But that effect kind of changes from the 25 year and up. And so, anyways, it, it's, it doesn't necessarily make it a, a, a statement for or against uh, land treatment necessarily, but it certainly shows that uh, land treatment has, is going to have effect on low-level flooding, and it's certainly going to have an effect on water quality. And it is an interesting contrast to what we've seen in Coon Creek, and I'm not sure what justifies that difference, but there, we sh there they seen that land management had an effect all the way up to like the 200-year event. It seemed to have a competitive edge on uh, dams. But there isn't, no doubt, there is an effect. This uh, shows the flow depth change at the Highway 56 bridge with the dams in place, with no dams, and with no dams and cropland converted to grassland. So that puts some context. It would be better to look at this chart probably at Avalanche or Bloomington. You know, the farther downstream you get, you start to, the effects of the dams are going to have a diminished effect on the outcomes, no matter what you're looking at. There's so much water coming in from uncontrolled tributaries that the effects of the dam way up in the upper watershed doesn't, doesn't have much of an effect anymore. So, anyways, these charts are worth looking at at, diff, at these different stations along the creek. And this is for flow rate, same thing. There's a comparison that you can make. But CFS doesn't usually mean much to most people, you know. I mean, they always want to know how much bigger is the floodplain or how much deeper will it get. But nevertheless, there it is. 
Um, we also looked at an alternative to replace the big dams with a multitude of smaller farm ponds. Um, and when we talked with the engineering firm about that, we're, we gave them constraints on what these ponds would look like, right? They can't be large dams that are under the jurisdiction of the dam safety program that are so large that they require, you know, the acquisition of land rights and a high level of operation and maintenance by county sponsors. We wanted to keep it on the farm pond level. And so these are generally dams that are around 15 feet tall with you know, roughly a half acre, an acre of pool. And they really only control the 25 year event. They sort of take the climbing limb of the hydrograph off, trim that off. Um, but if you get bigger events, the overflows are gonna kick in. So what we kind of found in a nutshell is that each farm pond that would be built in a watershed, we didn't look at all nine water, sub-watersheds, we just looked at Milsna. And on that particular sub-watershed, each farm that was built would reduce the 100-year peak flow at that dam site, at the Milsna dam site, by between 1% and 3%. So you'd have to build about 30 farm ponds to equate and provide the same level of protection as Mills and the Dam, which isn't insurmountable. It's just it would take a special initiative and concentrated effort in that area. So um, we also looked at you know the flood. You remove the dams and the floodplain is. It's going to increase both in scope. We mentioned about 295 acre increase in size uh, on the 100 year event. We also did, it's not necessarily a folly, but it came to my attention several times that, well, we're going to lose flood protection. And it's like, well, what's a reasonable person would say, well, what's that flood protection worth, you know? And so I kind of had the economist look at it, and he looked at it from just the cropland basis that what happens if, based on the economic models, how could you compensate someone for lost flood protection over 50 years if the dams were removed? And the results showed that it would be about $9,100 per acre. So in other words, if you wanted to compensate someone fairly for the loss of cropland protection, you know, to compensate them for the loss of cropland on these bigger storm events because the dams are gone, that compensation would be like $9,100 per acre. And it's almost, I don't, I'm not, and if you multiply that by it, the change in the 100-year floodplain, that's about $2.2 .2 million, which is less than the cost of a single dam. But I'm not mentioning this because I'm trying to like incite violence here and have people demand compensation for their loss of protection because it is a little bit of a folly in the fact that you're talking about a sliver for 30 miles. It, there's no practical way to execute it. But it does pr provide some perspective. Provide some perspective that you could, you could hypothetically compensate someone and that level of compensation is less than a single dam, the cost of replacing a single dam. And so that's sort of the reality of it, I guess. And lastly, the last slide, and you guys have been very patient, we did look at this whole climate effect. Unless you're living under a rock, you would know that the magnitude and frequency of large events over the last 15 years has been different than what you might have seen growing up as a kid, at least, at least it feels that way. So when these floodplain engineers evaluate these floodplains, they usually use a 30-year rolling average on weather patterns. 
But the last 15 years have been unusual. And so we executed a, a smaller contract with UW-Madison to, to try to create a statistical significant effect of weather in the last 15 years so that we could drop that into the model and see if it changed the benefit cost analysis. And so what we kind of found is this is a very hard chart to look at, but basically if you look at the two-year storm, 5, 10, 15, 25, 100-year frequency, 24-hour event, if you were to just base it on the last 15 years, the precipitation events would be right around six-tenths of an inch more. So in other words, a 100-year event in this area is seven and a half inches of rain in 24 hours. But if you were to... If you were to just base, if you were just a model based on the last 15 years, you'd add six tenths of an inch to that. So the 100 year is really 8.2 inches. So if you take 8.2 inches for a 100 year event and you slam it into the, the hydraulic, hydrology model, remap the floodplain, assign all the economic damage functions to it, what we found is it doesn't move the needle. These are pretty robust recommendations. The economic benefit cost ratios are solid. You're not going to move them easily. So if we want to replace these dams, it has to be because of some other reason than economics. So that's all I have. And I'm, the, the rest of the time, I'll entertain questions. And I want, keep in mind, we have a, we have Floodplain engineer here, the H and H engineer. We have our cultural resource specialist here. We have our state biologist here. Talk about fisheries. We have our state resource con. We can't wait to talk about PFAS and uh, okay, yeah. So I'll just kind of open it up for questions. Yep, go ahead, sir. Millsna Dam. Did you said you said Millsna Dam? Yeah, okay, thank you. The county. Yep. Oh, yeah, I know what I, I mean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, there's no spillways in that dam. You have no dry runs above that dam, dry pond. Why not? Tell me. I'm smart enough to figure out if you had three dry ponds up there and you'd have some spillways over that dam and you'd have a smaller, bigger tube under the dam, the dam would still be there. But nobody's smart enough to figure that out. Why the hell not? You guys, you stand yeah. up there and talk about money. You realize what the hell this country is spending on a war and bringing people into this country and green energy? And you're talking about money? What the hell are you talking about? Uh. The, the federal government's got hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to spend for out of this country in the damn country here they can't take care of themselves. Explain that. Yeah. You give us all kinds of figures and all kinds of bullshit and you don't come down to any common sense. How many... Dry dams are on the bridge of that lake. You wouldn't know, would you? Yeah. There's five. And they're all way high up in the valleys. That Jersey Valley Lake didn't have a damn bit of help. It didn't have nothing across the main channel and the water comes right out of here in the streets from Cashman. It goes yeah. down through there. How in the hell was the dam to stop it? And all you had was a, a goddamn sod runway out of that dam. That's all you had. Who the hell's sleeping on the job? Then you stand up there and get a all these figures. What it costs to fix it all is bullshit. You don't even live in this damn country. You don't know what the hell it's all about. Yeah. Why don't you come to realization? Well, ask the people in this room here if they don't agree with me. And you stand up there and, and try uh, to fix all this bullshit and all these surveys and all this shit. Come down to, if you'd have had some dry dams on this Jersey Valley Lake, it'd still be there. 
that them sad overrun. That's what you had. And they're helping a sad overrun not wash out. Well, I agree with you. There is a lack of dry dams upstream. That's truth. Where? I said, like I said, there is a lack of there is a lack of upland treatment like dry dams upstream. Five dry dams on the Jersey Valley Lake. Yeah. All hell. But they're so small they couldn't do much. You didn't put it in the main channel. It was a straight shot from Ashton to Jersey Valley. Nothing was nothing. But a lot of the places where you want to put those dry dams. Yeah. Why the hell are you worried what it's cost when we're spending trillions of dollars in other countries that don't take care of our own? Tell me that. Uh, I wish I could. Yeah, you can't. But you stand up there and tell us a bunch of bullshit and numbers that don't amount to shit. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Yeah, that's, those are really good questions. So, uh, number one is, when is this all going to take place, right? And the next question is, uh, yeah, as far as site-specific, how to decommission those site-specific areas, where is the dirt going to go, right? And what was the other question? Right. All right. Yeah. No. Yeah, those are those are really good questions. Um, so where where we're at in the process is hopefully by May first, uh, this report is going to be finalized, and the report is just a recommendation. The dams belong to the county. The counties have ultimate decision on which dams get decommissioned, if it's all of them or none of them or some of them, they make that call. And when the dams would be decommissioned is largely based probably on the flow of funding. The order in which they'll be decommissioned is also determined by the county. So I will, I will mention that. As far as the, the site-specific plan for the dams themselves, you know, the notching of the dam, where the notch will take place and where the the material will go. We don't have a detailed plan for that. It's just the concept that they're going to be notched out. And in concept, we're, we're not going to truck that material 15 miles away and stress out haul roads. We're going to contour it along the valley and along the residual embankment. But there is some flexibility on where some of that material could go. And that would be worked out on a site-by-site -site basis with the landowner in conjunction with the county, the lander won't be iced out on that decision. Yes. Correct. Yep. I will also say, under the footprint of the dam, that is private property. The counties hold an easement. And so... One of the decisions the county will have to decide is whether to return, or what do they call it, cancel the easement, or what's the official legal term for it? Yeah. But, yeah, that has to be discussed whether, you know, the county wants to be responsible for kind of maintaining the notch or if they're just going to turn the land rights back over to the landowner. That's a level of detail that needs to be resolved, and we haven't tackled that yet. So you're, we're looking at May to finalize the report. We're also looking at May and June to take whatever the county decides to do and seek funding for it. And we hope that we would go through the design of those decommissioning site by site. We would do that next winter. And construction would be in 2025 and 2026. 
So you are, the, the question you have is out ahead of anything. Nothing's been decided on a site-by-site -site basis. Yeah. I'm sitting in water chest. I am wondering if the, so we were talking about the beach. That includes access roads, rides, what? All. That, so that's all in the footprint. There's a, there's an easement under the footprint of the dam. There's a flowage easement of where the storms would back water up to. And then there's also an access easement. So there's three types of easements on each property that could be restored back to the original owners. So, so someone could just buy one and Yeah. So if, I understand why it's Yeah, thank thanks. you. I understand why it's important to focus on expediting the process because, like you said, this is in really vulnerable bedrock and you can't have those sitting around now that we know what the risk is. Um, but if there was interest in thinking about alternative ways to decommission or like different ways this could look, and it is kind of wild that this is the first time so many of these are happening at once and it seems like there are potential questions about different ways this could happen almost like as a model for other places where this might happen in the future would there have to be plans in place by may then to know what type of funding you want to request for potentially different types of project designs or are, are all of those plans going to have to be more or less on the table by May to get a sense of? I, I think the goal is by May is to have uh, the funding enveloped for what needs to be done as far as specific costs associated with how the decommissioning would be, how the, the access road, what condition it would be left in, all of those details would be worked out in the final design and funding would be acquired after the final design and cost estimate is prepared. Our goal for May is to just try to envelope the outside edge of what this stuff could cost so that the money is set aside. Okay. Yeah. But I, I will, you, you bring up one, one point that I wanted to make because it is an, an option that county supervisors have. For example, Klinkner Dam, they dropped $4 million into putting an armoring material over the back slope not too many years ago, right? If they said, that's the dam, we don't want to decommission. You need to kind of realize that something changed in 2018. Now we know the probability of failure is high. And we've had geotechnical people that have made their careers in it take a look at these structures and say they are vulnerable and they're at risk. And so if you want to keep the dam, the counties almost need to kind of go and get sign off by everybody who could be impacted by that dam. It's not one individual's decision to say, we want to keep the dam and make that decision on behalf of everybody else who could be impacted. So there, there probably needs to be some type of uh, uh, you got to kind of indent, everybody involved would have to indemnify the county because it's a known risk, right? And so that, that adds a different layer of trying to keep a dam. It's not one person's decision. It's not the guy who's just downstream. It's the guy who's downstream from him and the next guy that's downstream. They all have to agree to assume that risk because you can't ignore what you've already seen and what's being reported. So it's just an option though because that's what, the county has to weigh on a dam by dam basis of whether to take advantage of some funding that's currently available or to just keep the dam and then change their mind in five years when they have to put a new principal spillway pipe in and it costs 800000 they don't have it and now's the time to decommission it but now the funding's gone. 
there's no funding availability. So there's this timing issue about when to make decisions that needs to be considered. Yes, sir. Yeah, it'd be more of a, yeah, it'd be a translation. It'd just be shifting it with the valley slope down. So it'd be the same pool depth and size. It's just shifted. So it's 57 acres, 34 feet deep. We're going to try to meet that same target when it's 800 feet downstream. It'd still be the same. The height of the dam won't change. It'll be roughly the same height. It's just going to be moved downstream. Does that help? No, same. It would be the same. Correct. 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 The pool will just be shifted. The dam and the pool will be shifted. It'll be basically the same height. It'll look the same except instead of a vegetated spillway, it'll have a concrete one, something that's less vulnerable. And it'll just be shifted down. Yeah, that's an option. And yeah. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a real, a, the, the question is, is why replace Jersey Valley Dam, and if you were to replace it, why drop, why should the county drop an extra 500000 on a lift to, to create the recreational pool? Because without it, it'd probably be like a 20-acre lake, 10 feet deep. It's more on the wetland side of things. Right. No, no, but that's a good point. Yeah, all we, all we did was work out the funding without the dam replaced and worked out the funding with it replaced to its current. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. That's a really good point. And that was part of the debate back in 2009 about repairing the dam. One of the options was to replace it at a lower level. And at that time, it was rejected, you know, because they wanted the pool, you know. You know, I will add to your comments some of the other some of the other comments that we've gotten through like public scoping was the, the quality of the water isn't that great in like August, and 
that affects some of the people that are there. And so they thought if you were to rebuild the dam, you know that the, they, they put a cold water draw in it, right? Prior to its failure, it was taking the coldest water possible off the bottom and cycling it through. So some people thought maybe that some recreational opportunity could be developed on the downstream side where the water quality is a little better. There was another statement that says, well, if you're going to go through the bother of rebuilding the dam, can you enhance the park's value by putting a trail system in and, and embellishing the opportunities while you're at it? Because right now it's just a parking lot and bathrooms. You know, there's not much of a trail system or... Yeah, so there is an opportunity here, I think, to um, to add uh, some recreational attributes to the to the reconstruction in whatever shape that uh, recreational element could be added to the plan, um, or it could be scaled back, like you were mentioning. I mean, uh, like I said, our goal of the plan here is at least to try to just get the money enveloped and allocated to do something. And whether it falls short or not, you know, we could. Correct. Correct. You know, a lot of what you just said is, it's pretty important. And when this report comes out and says the recommendation is to remove the dams and the, and the fallback position is upland land treatment, there will be targeted federal money to try to re-energize the contour strips, the farm ponds, that is going to come out of this. I believe that. There is going to be a focused effort to try to make amends and try to focus in that watershed. And a lot of meetings with the watershed associations and the county conservationists and the NRCS will take place after this. This is sort of a kind of a benchmark and move in a different direction. I was asked a couple of times, they said, well, what were those people thinking back in 1958? What did they think was going to happen after 50 years? Well, I'll tell you what I think they thought, that we would be sitting here doing what we're doing now, and that is after 50 years, you kind of reevaluate your position, and it's more the same or you go a different direction. And I'm just kind of laying out that the recommendation is to take it a different direction, de-emphasize the dams, and try to put more federal money into land treatment and farm ponds. So, yes, sir.
right? And you know what? It's, it's that pointed comment that needs to go in the administrative record and the county has to carefully consider it. It's fallen back on the people you elected to make this call. This is just recommendation and what it costs and what the effects are. But whether they decide no dam or a full replacement or a scaled back version, that's in the county's bailiwick right now. Uh, just one sec. Do you have that speech? I, I, I want to make sure some of these comments are. Tim is recording for me, and I want to. Sorry. My property is right on the West Fork going through there. And yeah, the, a lot of rain was coming, all of that kind of stuff. But until the dam breached, there wasn't as much damage. And once it breached, I mean, so how do we know that? That's not going to happen again. How many years are you estimating? Second, if if there if there wasn't a dam there, I'm not persuaded that it would have been as bad as what it was with the breach of the dam. Yeah, yeah. So the question was: Is if you drop 17 million dollars to rebuild Jersey Valley Dam, is there? Do you have any promises that it isn't going to breach again? And her observations are is the breach would have been worse than having no dam there at all, and it's legitimate comment. And I can't make any promises. I tried to talk a little bit about what's been learned in 60 years of dam building in this country, and it's, it's a considerable amount of body of experience, and it would come to bear on this dam. But there is no promises. And if it was to be rebuilt, it would be rebuilt to control the 100-year flood. The 500-year, like the one we got, is still going to skate. Um, but I, I don't have a good answer for you. So. Yep. Yeah. Right. There's uh there's two separate maps. Okay, there's there's the GIS online version and that simply shows you where the 100-year floodplain is with the dams and without okay then there's a separate map that estimates where the water would go if the dam suddenly failed that's the breach inundation mapping it's a separate map the online uh, GIS viewer on that public portal that's just dams fully functional dams removed that's all it's going to provide and what, what is that portal? What is that portal? it's uh, CC and WFK, WFK and CC.com. What is it? .org. Oh, well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which is right, so he has access to those too yeah, so in Vernon County. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sir, there's, there's actually there's this website that was just given to you. That'll show with and without the dam. But yeah, Vernon County cool. sponsors a website that has the breach shadows, right? Those ones on the west fork, the creek watershed site, are those the ones on the plan? Or are those, are those the ones we didn't, we didn't post the post that, that, that study? Mm -hmm. that's 
Yeah, the one that's posted shows the model results with and without the dam. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Except those are to be studied in Vernon County. And Vernon County's is the current, yes. Uh, WFK and CC. And CC watershed. And CC watersheds. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I didn't write it down. <laughs> Sorry. You get A for effort. W uh, oh, here you go. Gillian. So uh, I, I'm just really curious about um, the different findings between the Coon Creek and the West Fork um, watersheds in terms of the potential efficacy of, of land treatments. And you said you weren't quite sure why that was, but um, who, who would, what part of your team came up with that or who could answer that question? Yeah, the, I mentioned in the presentation that the effects of land treatment seem to have, as a replacement for large dams, seem to be a little different in Coon Creek versus West Fort Kickapoo. There is some subtle differences. Um, and I, I'll, I'll work with our hydrologist to kind of help iron that out. I'm not quite sure. But, but uh, yeah, if you'd come up here, probably that'd be good. You know what I'm talking about, though, Megan, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. So one of the reasons why you're seeing differences, OK. Yeah. One of the reasons that you'll see land management differences between the results being different between Coon Creek as West Fort Kickapoo is the nature of the hydrology in your watersheds. You've got different shapes. Coon Creek is a little bit rounder, for lack of better words. Um, you know, you have West Fork Kickapoo is kind of tall, longer and narrower, where you can't get as much of that compounding as you get in Coon Creek with those land management changes. Um, West Fork Kickapoo, it's funneling into that main stem sooner, and so you don't get as much of that attenuation that builds up in Coon Creek from those land management changes. If you need further detail, I can you know, go into more detail um, with specific questions, but that's kind of the general idea of why West Fort Kickapoo didn't see as much change in that study compared to Coon Creek. All right. Thank you. Is there any other questions or concerns? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's my talk. So my source is Uriah Monday from the DNR. He was the flood in the floodplain management unit. Oh, there he is. Can you can you uh, can you answer that question? Because you're in the best position to answer that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. got to yell, though. Yeah, this is just recording, right? It's not amplified. Yeah. All right, so the detailed study on the West Fork doesn't start until fairly far downstream of Jersey Valley number one, okay? Or West Fork number one, Jersey Valley. So a lot of the uh, dams in the watershed are not immediately adjacent to that detailed study area. They're far enough upstream that their influence on flood attenuation is more immediately felt right in the vicinity of those dams. By the time it gets down to that detailed study um, location on, on the West Fork, a lot of their benefits are already sort of diminished getting that far down. So for that reason, if any of these are decommissioned, it won't have an impact on that detailed study area. Does that make sense? Uh, 
I think. I think. Are, what are, you, you, what are you talking I, about the the overall watershed study that's being? No, I think right he's now. meaning if there was a, a small, like a stream restoration project done in yeah. Zone AE. Oh, and sorry, would that be question. wasted effort? Yeah, would that's it be wasted asking. effort? Would that be wasted yeah. effort? I'm going to say no. Right, right, because that I understand where your question's coming from, Paul. Because Paul was looking at doing like a stream restoration project in the in the flood insurance zone of West Fort Kickapoo, and an earlier comment I had provided was, well, now don't get involved in something if the mapping's gonna change, right? The answer is the mapping is not is not gonna change. And so I think it's... But they are remapping them. Remapping Just the zone A around the immediate locale of the dams. Oh, the river itself. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was talking about. Maps are getting remapped and they're coming up the left of it. Oh. Yes. So you got a different answer, Paul. Sorry, Paul. I did a reversal on you. It just came from a different direction. That's all. Any other questions? Or all right. So I know there's some pretty strong feelings about it. One way to express those is to get it in the administrative record, so you get an official response. It gets posted, and those comments and responses is probably what the county supervisors are going to peruse through before they make a decision, I assume. So, Mark? That's that's a really thank You know that's a that's a really really good question and timely, right? His question is a follow up to the other gentleman that said on Jersey Valley Dam can we replace it not with the recreational lift for the lake but give it a smaller profile lake and it would be a full flow structure. It wouldn't do anything for flood control. What comes in is gonna go out. It's a big spillway. If that's the case, if it has no flood control or attenuation value, then it's simply a recreational structure. And the federal cost share is only 50-50. And although it probably won't cost 17 million, it'll probably be 16 million 500. And, and you're going to have to pay eight, the county would have to pay around 8 million. There really is no financial benefit for right. the county to a smaller lake. Because in that dam building business, two or three million dollars goes into the foundation before you even start building the dam. So a lot of those costs aren't going to change a whole lot. That 15 foot lift to increase the pool for some additional depth for 
maybe to keep fish from freezing out, things like that, that's a half million dollar lift. You know, all the money's in the spillway and the foundation. So thanks for bringing the comment up, but it changes the federal funding dynamic, that's for sure. Any other questions or concerns? Anything from the team that I missed? The economist must have something to say about it. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, 